All of our complaining the past few days about the pitchers available in MLB DFS has finally paid off because not only did we get rid of having to go at super terrible situations for pitching, we got one of the most ridiculous pitching slates I have seen on a non-opening day in a very, very, very long time. Once I list through the pitchers in the player pool for today, your jaw should drop if you don't already know who is starting. It is a fantastic slate, one of the favorites I've ever seen. So we're going to run through basically everybody, let you know where I'm at on them, how I view them in terms of rankings, my favorite guys, and hopefully grind out some stacks that grade out well for tonight too to get you set for what should be a fantastic slate of MLB DFS. Welcome on into the solo shot. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Here to break down for this Wednesday slate. So make sure you get your lineups in early uh, to account for that. So 6.40 p.m. Eastern is locked for this main slate. The good thing is outside of just the, the awesome starters, there's no weather. So we are flying pretty. It's going to be one of my favorite play, slates of DFS in quite some time. Before we dive in though, quick reminder to make sure you are subscribed to the number fire daily fantasy podcast. It's not just MLB DFS podcast. We of course have PGA. Our PGA championship preview is up with myself and Brandon Gadula breaking down this year's field, giving a rundown to the studs, value plays we like, roster construction, everything you need to know to hopefully fill out some good lineups and win some cash. Speaking of that, the PGA is back in a big way this weekend with a massive daily fantasy contest on FanDuel. This week's PGA Mega Eagle Contest includes $400,000 in total prizes with first place getting you hundred k first of all, or best of all. It is only $9 to enter to get yourself a chance at all that cash. Go to FanDuel.com or download the FanDuel app. Eligibility restrictions apply. Pitching preview is sick. For tonight on FanDuel, the highest salary pitcher on FanDuel is Garrett Cole checking in at $10,600. Pablo Lopez, ten five. Max Scherzer, 10-4. Lucas Giolito, 10-3. Shohei freaking Otani is 10-1. Kevin Gosman, who's been arguably the best pitcher in baseball this year, is the fifth or sixth highest salary guy. He's 98. Zach Wheeler, 95. And then we have Dane Dunning and Blake Snell as the others at $8,000 or higher. My goodness, the number of Cy Youngs on this slate and future Cy Youngs for some of those guys as well. It's an amazing pitching slate. And because of that, I don't want to gloss over anyone. Usually we just do two studs and a value. I can't do that for today. So rather than focusing on just those two studs, I'm going to run through quick thoughts on each of the top options. And I will rank them after accounting for situation and salary. But ideally, you can listen to my thoughts on these guys, these very brief thoughts and decide what you want to prioritize, what you value, and rank them based on that. Let's go through each of these guys. Kevin Gosman is at home facing the Mariners. He has been lights out this year. 2.21 skill interactive ERA. That is the second best mark on the slate behind Shohei Otani. The Mariners are not a high strikeout team. They're at 20% against righties, but like, my goodness, Gosman's disgusting. Scherzer is the other top guy who is at home for today. He's facing the Cardinals. They are not a great offense against righties, but they also don't strike out that much. They have an 18% strikeout rate, which is tied for the lowest mark on the slate. Uh, But Scherzer, 33% strikeout rate for him. That is third on the slate behind Otani and Garrett Cole. Speaking of those two, let's get to them next. They are both in the road, which is why, you know, wanted to go through the home guys first. Cole is facing the Orioles. I talked about them the past two days, too, and it didn't go great. Last night for Jameson Tyone, but again, nobody uh, I went wanted to use a pitcher did well last night. Uh, they're a non-threatening matchup for a righty, a good righty. They got a 23% strikeout rate. Uh, Cole's strikeout rate is up to 33% in the five starts with his fastball usage being up. That's a very good number. Otani's on the road against the Rangers, which is a good matchup for him. They have an 84 WRC plus against righties based on their current active roster with a 22% strikeout rate. Otani's strikeout rate, as mentioned, is the highest in the slate, 35%. I do want to note, though, that his velocity did decline a bit his last time out. I had the over on his strikeout prop, and he went under. Um, So maybe it's like a little post-tilt situation. Uh, But noticing that, I would say, just given the amount of wear and tear on that guy, like with how much he plays, how hard he plays, that stuck out to me. So just keeping that in mind. Pablo Lopez, 
I think is probably a bit underappreciated still. He, he's at home against the Nats. His skill interactive ERA, 2.76 with a 28% strikeout rate, tremendous batted ball numbers. And, you know, the Nats are slightly above average uh, from a matchup perspective in terms of strikeout rate. Uh, but, like, that's fine. Uh, actually, slightly below average, I should say. But Lopez is great. That's why he's in this discussion. That's why he's number two in terms of salary. I don't blame him. Zach Wheeler also at home against the Rays. They have a 24% strikeout rate against righties with a 95 WRC+. plus. Wheeler's velocity was low his first two starts, and we got four starts with that being back up, but his strikeout rate is bounced back to 28%. Just still some slight lingering reservations about pitch count with him because the Phillies in general have been very weird with that this year. Finally, Lucas Giolito's coming off the COVID IL. I'm not sure what his pitch count will be because of that. He stays in the Royals. They're still a decently low strikeout team, so those two things do ding him for me. All things considered, I'm going to rank Kevin Gosman number one for today. I prefer guys who are at home, and Gosman has the edge above Scherzer in terms of like what he's looked like this year. Um, he's facing a higher strikeout team, so Gosman is one. Number two, I'm going back and forth on. I think I'm going to put Garrett Cole there. It's between Cole and Scherzer, I think. Um, you know, Scherzer is at home, but Cole, I like the matchup more. I like what he's been doing recently a bit more. So I'm going to put Cole second. Let's go Cole second, Scherzer third. I'll put Otani fourth. If it weren't for the dip in velocity last time out, I probably would put Otani like second at least. Um, so it, that's the one thing that does concern me, but I got a nitpick on a, a loaded slate. So I'll put Otani fourth. Pablo Lopez is fifth for me. I don't use five pitchers ever in DFS. Might break that rule tonight. I, I do want to get some Pablo Lopez in there. I want to get Otani, Cole, Scherzer, Gosman. I might break my rule for tonight. Typically, I stick to three, uh, two or three at pitcher. I try to keep things super concentrated. I might break that rule for tonight, though, to get Lopez in there. He, I would not be shocked at all if he winds up being the highest scoring guy. Most likely will not get to Wheeler and Giolito. I, I got to cut the make the cutoff somewhere. It's a bummer, but I think it's necessary. Just too good of a slate overall. So... To me, it is it is Gosman 1, Cole 2, Scherzer 3, Otani 4, Lopez 5, and that's where I draw the line for tonight. As a result of all these 6-6-6-6-6 six, 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 six studs, I'd probably be opposed to a value play here personally. You just need a lot of juice to overcome all those arms. You need a lot of guys to fail for a value play to be the highest scoring guy on tonight's slate. I would rank Dane Dunning highest among the value plays. His pitch counts are up finally. He's facing a higher strikeout opponent. The Angels are very, very good, obviously, but they do strike out. Um, that's why I prefer to pay up. But if you really want to save, he'd be my preference there. But overall, just a loaded slate. And if you disagree with me and think, hey, I love Zach Wheeler. I want to use him tonight. Cool. Like, that's totally defensible. There are a lot of guys you can defend. So dig in a bit. Do some research beyond just what I mentioned. Uh, decide where you wind up on these guys and act accordingly. Um, because I do think it's a slate where you have a lot of leeway to play things however you would like to do so. The problem with having absurd pitchers on an eight-game slate is that eventually you got to find some stacks. and It's tough if everyone's facing a Lopez uh, or a Gosman or something like that. So stacks a little bit tougher. I do like our top couple ones, though. And the first one here is going to be the Miami Marlins. I think Josiah Gray is going to be a good pitcher one day because he gets strikeouts. And that's the, the first major obstacle to becoming an ace. But for right now, Gray is allowing some pretty rough batted ball numbers. And I think we should stack against him until he reigns that in. That means stacking the Marlins for today. Uh, for the season, Gray has a 44% hard hit rate allowed with a 51% fly ball rate, which is a really rough combo, but it's also in line with where he was at last year. The fastball specifically has been getting crushed for Gray, and I think that he knows this because he's cut back on the usage of that fastball in his past four starts. He's throwing more sliders instead, and I think that's a very good change for him. I think it's encouraging to see that shift occur. But even in that stretch, he's let up a 52% fly ball rate with a 41% hard hit rate, and that does include a game against these very same Marlins, and it was at home. He had 10 strikeouts there, which is very good, but he still let up four earned runs in five and two thirds innings, which is kind of the story you get with Josiah Gray. He will get strikeouts, but there are some issues when he doesn't get that third strike. I'm fine with that from a stacking perspective. So even in a non-elite park like Miami, 
I do think that the Marlins kind of have to be our top stack for today. They are an underappreciated offense and one in a good spot. So I want to act accordingly on a tough slate for stacking and rank the Miami Marlins number one for tonight. As we discussed previously, Jazz Chisholm is the priority on this team for stacking against a righty. I do want to touch briefly on Brian De La Cruz because he may not play. He's a righty um, and that could squeeze him out of the order, but they've had him start against a righty three consecutive games. And when he's been in there, he's been really good. His expected Woba is 361. He's drawn some walks, decent strikeout rate. It seems like the Marlins are pushing the arrow up on De La Cruz because he's been getting starts more consistently. And I will have him on my radar if he plays. So Jazz Chisholm is the building block, priority number one, no questions asked. But De La Cruz is someone, if he's in there again, I'm pretty open to. I think that uh, I've seen enough where I, I be, can be convinced to use him. He may not play again because, again, I think they want to get Jesus Sanchez in there a bit. But De La Cruz is at least very interesting if he does play. I'm going to put the Blue Jays second for stacking. They're facing Marco Gonzalez, who has a good ERA this year. But some of the stuff under the hood is very dicey. Gonzalez has always been a low strikeout guy, and things are getting worse in those departments. He has a 6.5% swing strike rate this year, which means his 15% strikeout rate is probably going to stay low unless something changes. He's also letting up a 41% hard hit rate with the fly ball rate at 38%. That leads to an expected ERA of 5.40, which is much higher than his actual ERA of 3.38. We have seen him have some cracks in the facade against pretty good teams. He led up three home runs to the Twins in his first start this year. He led up two to the Astros on May 2nd, two to the Rays on May 7th. So we've seen good teams get to get to Gonzalez at times. He can have some good starts too, but it's hard to ignore the upside he gives opposing batters based on the low strikeout rate and the very good batted ball numbers. That's especially true when it's a righty heavy lineup, which is exactly what the Jays have. So I think we need to be high on the Jays here for stacking against Gonzalez for tonight. Now you could make an argument. They could be above the Marlins as well, but for the full season, the Jays have been uh, very okay with batting Santa Santiago Espinal in the middle of the order. And I've been pretty resistant to using him. I have viewed him as a lower upside guy, uh, but it's been all bet hit fifth uh, against two lefties over the weekend. And I actually like looking into him for today. I, I do like him more than I thought I would. He does put the ball in the air a decent amount. He's making decent contact this year. He can swipe a bag. So we still have my favorite guy here. And among the, the non elite guys, I'm still going to prefer Matt Chapman because I love the dinger side that he has, uh, Teoscar Hernandez is $3,000. Boba Shad also is under salary at 34. Um, but like, so Espino is not number one among the value plays. I like Chapman and Hernandez more, but I'm higher on Espino now than I was earlier in the year. And I am receptive to him, including him in stacks on a team that I'll have a lot of exposure to. So Espino to me, better than I thought he was going to be when I started to look into him. I'm going to put the Yankees in the third slot here. It's not something that I want to do because I like some of what Jordan Lyles has done so far this year. But like I said, it's a tough slate for stacking. They've had success against him. And there's been some funkiness for Lyles recently. Specifically, Lyles' velocity isn't what it was to open the year. On his 14 fastball, his velocity in his first three starts was 92.6 miles per hour or higher each time. It hasn't topped 92.2 cents, and his past two starts specifically, it's been under 92. And we see a similar pattern with his off-speed stuff, too, his curveball and his slider. And seeing Velo go down as the as we get away from the colder days, to me, is a pretty big red flag, because warmer weather leads to higher velocity, but Lyles is working the opposite direction. It's led to some rough results. He led up three home runs and six earned runs to the Yankees on April 26th. He let up four runs to the Tigers last time out, but but most importantly, he's letting up hard contact and fly balls again, which he was not doing earlier in the year. So I respect Lyles and what he has done, and it would be fun if he could keep this up, but there are some pretty big cracks here. And on this slate, those cracks allow us to stack the Yankees and feel pretty good about it, despite the fact that I do respect what Lyles has done. As far as platoon splits go, I do want to bump up the lefties here. Lyles led up a 45% fly ball rate to lefties last year versus 36% for righties. The strikeout rate was also lower for lefties. 
it's been kind of similar in a small sample this year. It's more so via the ground ball rate uh, to lefties than the than fly ball rate. But ground ball rates lower for lefties. That's good. Uh, lower strikeout rates. So I bump up Anthony Rizzo. Bump up Joey Gallo, who is now 0 for 10 since I decided to start using him again. So that's great. I'm probably not going to get to Aaron Hicks if he plays. Uh, but I will be high on Rizzo and Gallo just because... Uh, we've seen Hicks struggle a lot with them, specifically the strikeouts and fly balls, and that's where those two guys can excel. So I, I think that those two guys, to me, deserve a bump up. Not above Stanton or Judge, but a bump up relative to where you typically have them and relative to Gleyber Torres, Josh Donaldson, DJ LeMayhew, and others. Things to watch for today. I mentioned Lucas Giolito's pitch count earlier. I'm also unsure what to expect from Blake Snell. He's made three rehab starts before coming back up. In those rehab starts, he went 44, 67, and 59 pitches. Now, the 59 pitches came across five innings. So it was likely a spot where they were like, hey, we're happy with what you've done. Get out of here and go on your way back to the big leagues. I currently have Snell projected for 80 pitches. I think on a slate this good, we can avoid him. And it is a tough matchup with the Phillies too. So uh, no Snell for me tonight based on those factors, but I am uncertain of where to project him from a pitch count perspective. Not sure who will start for the Pirates yet. It was supposed to be Mitch Keller, but he's in the bullpen now. It's not very warm at Wrigley for today, about 58 degrees. The wind is in at about seven miles per hour. So it's not a perfect spot, but it's a thin slate for stacking. I would not be shocked if the Cubs wound up being in a decent option, but just keep in mind the weather's not ideal necessarily for stacking for today. Finally, I would consider the Mets uh, for one-offs or maybe for some stacking if you need a fourth option. They're facing Jordan Hicks, and the transition for him to being a starter has been a bit rocky so far. Not as many strikeouts, a lot of walks. Uh, his ERA in five starts is 5.09. And the one reason I wasn't looking to stack against necessarily was it just doesn't let up a lot of fly balls. And that's why they're lower on this list. But other issues do put the Mets in play for today if you need an option beyond the Yankees, Marlins, and the Blue Jays. Let's finish up here with our dinger calls for today. I got to go Jazz Chisholm. I just, I, I love him as a player. I love the, the matchup that he's got today against Josiah Gray. Don't love the park, but the matchup, very good. So Jazz Chisholm, any excuse I can get to talk about him and use him in DFS, I'll take it. He will be the boring home run call for today. The fun one is Matt Chapman. Uh, I talked about him on Monday, I think it was, and he was like two for 30 or something like that in his previous 30 played or at bats. And he went yard there. And I think that that's kind of what you get with Chapman. You get a lot of streakiness, but you get some dinger upside. And I like that for sure. I could have gone to Oscar because he's his salary is 3000. I try to keep things below 3000 here uh, for the fun home run call, but we'll go Chapman. Uh, so the home run calls for today, Jazz Chisholm and Matt Chapman. That is all that we have here for today on the solo shot. But once again, a reminder, go check out our PGA DFS podcast, getting you set for the PGA championship. Just search for the number fire daily fantasy podcast feed, wherever you get your podcasts uh, while you're there, hit subscribe, leave a rating and review. If you like what you hear, we also did betting preview of the PGA championship. If you are, uh, inclined to, to do that instead. Uh, that was with Andy Molitor of Betsperts. Got his thoughts on some outrights, some non-outrights he likes this week, his view of the course, and much more. That's on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. I'm on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Enjoy this glorious, beautiful, magnificent slate. Uh, pick the picture you want. Dive in. Feel free to, to kind of go whichever way the wind blows you, but I think it should be a fantastic slate. Cherish it while you can, because as we saw the past two nights, it's not always a given. Good luck to you. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow for more MLB DFS. This has been the solo shot right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.